Okay, so the new characters involve micromorphology and microstructure. And in conceiving these characters, we are using new models of septal growth. Um, model, biomineralization models have um, advanced tremendously since that old model that I showed you um, earlier in the talk. And now this one is written by, was conceived by Yarick himself. And um, here, these are two different septa. And instead of trabeculae, we have centers of rapid accretion. And within each of these centers are one or more calcification centers arranged in different ways in different taxa. And then surrounding these centers of rapid accretion are thickening deposits. So we've been thinking about um, characters in a much different way in light of these new models of septal growth. And the first set of characters I'll show you are micromorphology. Uh, this is the shapes of teeth and granules along the margins and faces of septa. Each one of these plates here are, is a septa. And what you can see is that this is sponge shaped, these in the Atlantic, and have these spikes coming off the faces of the septa. And the area between the spines is, consists of horizontal layers. And different septa have more or less the same types of teeth. By contrast, with the Pacific, we've got more triangular-shaped teeth that are thicker. The granules, in other words, these bumps on the side are, um, are not very prominent. They're rounded knobs, essentially. And in different septa, there are different types of teeth. So if you look very closely, these are two, family, or two groups that were thought to be members of the same family, but now um, the new molecular tree suggests they belong to completely different clades you can see that there are um, distinctive differences between the two. Uh, these differences can be interpreted within um, the context of the uh, model of septal growth I just showed. Uh, here, the main axis of septal growth is um, are these red lines. And the yellow lines are calcification axes that are secondary. These tend to be much more better developed in the Atlantic than in the Pacific. And thickening deposits tend to be much um, better developed in the Pacific. And as a result of the combination of different types of calcification axes and different types of thickening deposits, we have um, different types of teeth expressed in the two groups. OK, so mapping these characters onto the molecular tree, we see um, higher statistics, um, much better agreement. But most importantly, there's more resolution towards the base of the tree. It's still not perfect, but it's closer. OK. So um, we've performed a few preliminary analyses using the morphologic, uh, the new morphologic characters. And this is some of the results. Here is a molecular tree, here is a morphologic tree, and here is a combined tree. Um, the molecular tree and the morphologic tree don't disagree in any way. We just have much more resolution in the molecular tree towards the base of the tree and much more resolution in the morphologic tree towards the branch tips. And so that when you combine the two um, approaches and create a combined tree, um, you get a fairly well-resolved tree. So the next step is to add fossils. We've done a little bit of that. Um, that's pretty much what I intend to do over the next few years is add more fossils. Um, so here, these are the clades in the, that previous diagram. The red species are recent. The green are Miocene and Pliocene. The blue are Ligocene, and the black are, are Eocene. And just because I'm not sure that everybody knows the age dates for these, Eocene runs from 50, 56 to 34 million years ago. The Oligocene from 34 to 23 million years ago, and the Myopliocene from 23 to two million years ago. And what you can see is that there are essentially four minor clades represented in this um, tree. One of them are clades one, five, and six all have re uh, Eocene representatives contained within them. And clade two also has um, Oligocene. And so what this suggests, and then also we've got these two clades down here, seven and eight, which are, consist mostly of, um, of uh, modern and, and uh, myopliocene taxa, but they are basal to the rest of the tree. 
This suggests that these subclades within the new Atlantic clade all arose at, during Eocene time at about the same time that the new Atlantic clade itself arose. And we'll continue to work on this because this, this is, I say, is just a preliminary analysis. So today there are th three kind of biodiversity centers for corals. There's one in the, uh, Indi Indonesia, there's one out here in the Indian Ocean, and there's one in the Caribbean. And traditional taxonomy suggests that the Pacific and Indian Ocean centers share 100 percent of gender and majority of species, but that the Caribbean and Pacific share 70 percent of gender and no species. So in other words, this um, traditional taxonomy suggests that the Caribbean is just a depauperate subset of the Pacific, and most of the origination is going on in the Pacific um, and essentially feeding the Caribbean. Our results um, are contrary to that. They suggest that one or more uh, family level clades of exclusively Atlantic corals diverge from a more cosmopolitan Tethian faunal prior to Middle Eocene time. So here's the Cretaceous, and during the Cretaceous there was a seaway that ran across the globe called the Tethian Seaway, um, and uh, essentially larvae here in the Indian Ocean could move across the Tethys all the way across the Isthmus of Panama. But by the Middle Eocene, the, this connectivity amongst um, all the populations in the area began to split up and you see the Atlantic Ocean widening and uh, you see the Tethians starting to close here, in, essentially in the Middle East, and uh, the start of the Isthmus of Panama, although that doesn't close it until a little bit later. Uh, so at this time, uh, here in the Middle Eocene is where we start to see the new Atlantic clade arise and the subclades within it also are arising. Okay, so many subclades within one exclusive Atlantic clade, that's the one I've been talking about, also diverge prior to the Middle Eocene and speciation occurred within these subclades throughout the Cenozoic. One thing I didn't point out in that um, tree that included the fossils is that there are uh, members of many different ages within each of the clades. Okay, and then finally, this is something I haven't had a chance to talk about, much of the cosmopolitan Tethian fauna became regionally extinct in the Caribbean by Myopliocene time as the Central American Isthmus closed. Okay, so what does this mean for marine conservation? Um, this is a map of uh, marine protected areas. I just recently um, downloaded it. And in this map you can see that the protected areas are indicated by red and orange blobs and also by these blue outlines and green uh, hatch marked. But um, efforts are much more intense in the um, Pacific than they have been in the Caribbean. And part of the reason for this is because of the difference in diversity between the two regions. The Caribbean has more than 700, the Indo-Pacific has more than 700 species, whereas the Caribbean has about 60 species. So, as I say, conservation's efforts have focused on these biodiversity hotspots in, in the Pacific. And what our work suggests that um, not only should these biodiversity hot spots receive special conservation efforts, but also um, those places that are evolutionarily unique, like the Caribbean. So here, although less diverse, Caribbean reef corals do not represent a depauperate subset of a cosmopolitan Indo-Pacific fauna, as indicated by traditional taxonomy. One or more family level Caribbean clades are evolutionarily distinct from the Indo-Pacific corals and diverge more than 50 million years ago. Conservation efforts should be directed at preserving clades, <coughs> monophyletic groups, in addition to uh, biodiversity hotspots. Okay, so the third part of the talk. This involves the evolution of species. And here um, our efforts have been concentrated on the Monasteria annularis species complex. And this species complex was long thought to be just one species, which, which had two distinguishing characteristics. One, it had 24 septa, and two, it had two to 3.5 millimeter corallite diameters. So in about the mid-1990s, uh, with the development of different molecular techniques, it was recognized that this one species actually consisted of a complex of 
three species. Um, the three include Monostria annularis sensu strictu, which forms columns, uh, Monostria favulata, which forms mounds with skirt-like edges, and Monostria franksi, which forms bumpy mounds. The initial genetic data that were used to distinguish the complex consisted of AFLP nuclear markers. Um, and in these analyses, Monostria franksi and Monostria annularis have a diagnostic 920 band, which I think you can see, whereas Monostria favulata has the 880 band. Um, the differences between Franksi and annularis are much more subtle. They involve frequency differences in, in genotypes. And in Panama, um, the AAA genotype, uh, annularis has more of blue as annularis, red as Franksi, green as favulata. Whereas um, the AA star, um, Franksi has more of. By contrast, in uh, the Bahamas, for AAA and AA star, there's, there's really no di difference. There are um, genetically um, no significant differences. So this suggests that the structure of this species complex is fairly complicated. Um, because of the fact that we as paleontologists never recognized that this was a, a species complex, um, we've once again gone back to the drawing board and rethought our characters. And in this case, we've been using a geometric morphometrics approach to, dis to try to distinguish the three species in the complex. And we've digitized 25 um, landmarks on corallites. These landmarks were selected to emphasize the relief of the septa, essentially the elevation of the septa and the way it goes down into the, the columella, and also the structure of the corallite wall. 